So I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about material compatibility and reliability of testing of high power interconnects uh, for single phase cooling. Um, first, I want to uh, give a shout out to um, uh, Vishwash, Harish, and Nutharpunga. They did a lion's share of the work in our India design team, and they weren't able to make it here, so uh, I'm, I'm presenting for them. And uh, so I want to give a great thank you to all the work that they've put together. So what I'm going to be talking about today is um, really a lot of what uh, was presented a few minutes ago in terms of uh, the testing that we've done and also, but we went through and performed a reliability test on the connectors as if you were doing it um, in fluids instead of in air, for example, for the EIA standard. And so I'll go through some of the challenges that are there and some of the challenges that are then we bring back to the community to talk about how do we come up with an EIA standard, for example, uh, for components and not just power components but uh, electrical components in general um, in the uh, immersion environment. Okay, so where am I? As we explored the electrical and mechanical environmental tests, when we do the accelerated testing, we've talked here several times about uh, some of the challenges with doing elevated temperature testing. And that's going to be one of the things that we need to define within our community of what does that elevated testing look like for components? Because we know what it does in air, and we're chasing very specific failure modes when we do that in air. So when we choose to now have a different environment that where air is not playing a role, we have to figure out what failure modes, which is what uh, one of our subgroups is working towards, that we need to perform our accelerated tests to create the failures or define at, at what point those failures occur um, as we uh, uh, validate our products. Also having these standards is going to be critical towards uh, many of the other topics that we've been discussing this morning. For example, for, for our community to be able to provide warranties for these products, we have to have uh, commonized standards that we test to um, so that we can uh, make that relationship between how a product will perform at the end of its life and um, what the accelerated testing is that we're proposing. So we, we evaluated two, two connectors specifically, um, ORV3 IT gear input connector and the, some of the links here uh, are, will be available for you to you know, go and, and understand the very specifics on the connector. So um, we also evaluated, oh, I keep hitting the wrong button there, okay. Uh, an, another connector that uh, for uh, extreme power, and both of these, we had very, very similar results. You will see some of the differences uh, as I get into material compatibility, and uh, we can talk about what that might mean in some of our uh, future testing. The fluids that we looked at are the, um, we looked at one synthetic PAO and a, and a fluorocarbon. So there, there's several fluid types out there. You can see from material compatibility uh, what, what other fluid types there are to evaluate. This also is one of our challenges as we move forward is understanding how many fluids or types of fluids or can we group them into groups to reduce the burden of, of validating components. Because just because you can validate one component um, to one fluid doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to work in another fluid. And that, that also will play a role in many of the uh, warranty, total cost of ownership challenges, uh, recommendations for the community as a larger whole. One other factor is on the reliability testing. So, so this slide here highlights um, when you're doing accelerated thermal aging, for example, in air, you, you would have 105C for 240 hours. Now that has been established through many, many decades of, of industry testing and, and life that that's the equivalent of 65C in 10 years life, right? And, and those relationships are well established. 
those relationships and the failure modes that you're chasing are not well established within the uh, uh, immersion application. And that's what we want to highlight here and what we will go through and discuss some of the challenges that are in front of us. So when we looked at material compatibility of the two connectors that we were evaluating, uh, we did see some challenges when we tested to the uh, ASTM spec as far as <clears throat> um, ADC for 21 days, specifically on some of the cables that were there. And so as we understand what that is, we will look to, you know, those are, those are standard industry cables, and now we understand that some of that needs to change in the, uh, in the immersion environment. The other connectors, when you test them, we, we, there were no issues there. The, the, one of the important things to highlight, though, is if you rerun that test at 60 degrees C, for example, you don't see any, any issues with those components, which would be the operating, maximum operating temperature maybe in that application. So um, we need to understand that relationship when you go from 60 to 80 C in your test environment, does that really correlate to uh, one year, five year, 10 years, 20 years of life before you would see the equivalent uh, degradation at 80 degrees C in an immersion environment. We know what those relationships are in air, but we don't know what they are in fluid. So just at this point in time, just to say, yeah, I saw a degradation or a performance difference in a component or a subcomponent at 80 C for a 14-day test right now doesn't necessarily mean or correlate to uh, the performance at the end of life. 10 years out. We, we, we don't know what that relationship is just yet. So that, those are things that we need to work through. So our test setup, as you saw before, very similar. Uh, we have a tank where we're bringing the cool coolant um, into the bottom, and then uh, it circulates up through the top and down back in through the, the heat exchanger. And uh, so just following natural convection as we uh, power the components. And similar to what you saw before, the results were uh, uh, very encouraging in terms of the ability of the connector to handle uh, nearly twice the current load as rated in air. Now, we're utilizing a, a number of assumptions in this process. When, when we do this, we're looking at, oh, well, 30 degrees C rise. Um, that's also a, an artifact of the air environment when we do this, we need to decide if 30 degrees C is the right temperature rise in fluid. Maybe it's 50 C, maybe it's only 10. I, I, I don't think we really know what the right value is other than, well, it works in air, and there was, there's these relationships related to most of the time we're talking about ambient temperature, so we're starting at 25 degrees C, or we have a, a identified in the, um, data center that the, the highest it's going to get is uh, 30 or 40 C for the air temperature, and so the component, we don't want it to go above 90 C, right? Um, in the fluid environment, those relationships are slightly different, so even this 30 degree C evaluation, while it gives us good comparison to what we do in air, doesn't, isn't necessarily optimized for what we could do in fluids. Um, nevertheless, the connectors performed extremely well uh, using that 30 degree C as a reference point. Uh, we also went through and attempted to do a series of reliability tests according to uh, the EIA standard, which is listed here. So you can see there are uh, essentially uh, six groups of environmental sequences, and we also did um, some electrical tests. <clears throat> those, those six groups, that's a standard connector sequence that is specified by EIA. In the, in the EIA standard, these, these test groups are designed to specifically elicit certain failure modes that occur in, a, in the air environment, right, through oxidation or, or other effects that, that are driven by the, the chemical composition of air. So when we try to perform these tests in fluid, we're doing two things wrong, right? We're doing, one is we don't know that we have that same relationship between the accelerated test and the end of life, and then two is we're, the failure modes that occur in fluid 
may not be the same and most likely are different than the failure modes of a particular product in air. So we need to come up with a new test group, a new sequence of tests that represent what do we want to find out about our connectors or performance evaluation in fluid. Uh, so two of the groups are relatively straightforward, uh, temperature life and um, a thermal shock with cyclic temperature. So these two sequences we did perform, we did have to perform some modifications to the, the processes in order to accomplish these test sequences, and then, um, uh, and which I'll go through uh, here in a second. So when we evaluate the temperature sequences, um, what's important to understand is uh, T-Life, we did the same, we did 105C for 240 hours, and uh, we performed that on uh, the, the 1060 connector, not the uh, ORV3 cable. So when we performed that test, we saw no issues, and also we were able to do that without any modifications to the process. So putting the fluid in a chamber, putting our connector in the, in the fluid, and testing it for uh, 240 hours. The thermal shock, test had some other challenges. First, if you're putting the, a, a tank in your environmental chamber, it's the, the fluid has a, a very large thermal mass. So it's extremely difficult for you to bring it, the temperature up or down on such a large thermal mass in a chamber. So we, we chose an alternative approach where we had used two chambers, keeping f fluid tanks in each chamber and maintaining the temperature, the negative 55C and the um, 85C uh, for the temperature. So using that, we were simply moving the part back and forth between the two chambers uh, according to the EIA standard. And that, that was the process we, we chose there. and. When you get to the second sequence in there, which is uh, the humidity cycling, again, humidity is a function of something that happens in air. The moisture can be stored in the air. That doesn't happen in the fluids, so that portion of the test we didn't perform, and that's one of the things we want to highlight is, for example, this sequence wouldn't apply in an application where, where the component is submersed all the time. Uh, we also performed a durability sequence, cycling the parts um, inside the fluid, which has material handling challenges, uh, where, where that, that means you, you need to use PPE and do those mechanical cycles um, in the fluid, or you would have to develop fixtures and, and or automation to do those type of uh, connections all, all fully submersed. So here are some of the sequences that we did not perform and, and some challenges back to the community on what would we do for either replace these or identify um, alternative methods to uh, uh, perform these tests. Specifically, uh, MFG and dust, right? So the, these are looking for failures at the interface level that are probably not practical in the uh, immersion environment. You're not going to get dust collection. You're not going to get uh, the corrosive nature of what MFG is. That's a, you know, basically you're introducing a, a corrosive chemicals into the air to cause corrosion at your uh, contact interfaces. So, so those two failure modes don't necessarily occur in the fluid, but there are other chemical reactions that are occurring in the fluid, and these tests here are not designed to, to chase or identify those or provide comparisons between different levels of performance of connectors. And so that's, that's one of the ones that we would highlight. Then the other area is vibration and thermal cycling. So what is the uh, challenge for us is how do, what vibration? Do you vibrate the entire tank, right? Do you vibrate the component after you've dunked it in the tank and take it out? What, what does that look like, and, and what is the, the mechanical features that you're trying to identify through that failure mode? So these sequences here are a real challenge and redefining out. So the call to action, as I'm gonna, I'll get to in a minute, will be for our industry, our components, our manufacturers, groups to reach out to these standards bodies and talk to them and ask them to start thinking about how do they want to create specifications, right, through our contribution for validating components so that we can provide reliability information to our 
our customers and of course to the industry that would identify warranty, for example. Okay, so last tests were post tests. We did some uh, dielectric tests and insulation resistance and those all were passing and really you can see that the fluid is in many ways improves the consistency of the product over time. It acts almost like a lubricant for us and, and so has a number of positive attributes. Uh, also here are some other tests uh, uh, now where lubrication might play a role in a sense to hurt us which is um, contact retention, for example, or mate and demate forces could be substantially changed by having that lubricant introduced to the interface. Um, here, in these instances, we passed, but those, all of these areas are areas that where we could refine or change the design based on optimizing it for the fluid environment. And I would go back to something that Ralph uh, said earlier about Right now, a lot of the things that we're doing in these connectors is about taking something that's designed for air and just dropping it in the tank. And when we do that, we're missing out on an opportunity to do, for example, these ORV3 connectors. Maybe we use half as much copper to get the same current level instead of going to twi twice the current level, right? Well, which one is more sustainable? I think that's a really important question that we need to ask ourselves, right? Um, I think we need to ask ourselves, also about can we make the connector half the size and really compact the density of what we're doing as well. Those are options that we can have. So in summary, as I described before, um, the majority of the tests that we were able to perform in fluid versus in air, um, really no issues. We're seeing that very, very compatible, um, but we only tested two fluids and I know there are 13 or 18 of them out there right now. So lots of questions. Uh, so that, that's my summary for today. I think the most important thing is that as a community, we need to start reaching out to the standards bodies, IEC, EIA, UL, and start making sure that they understand the growth of this industry and challenging them to contribute back what what these standards might look like for our application environment because the air environment does not apply. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or anything else that I can address? One sort of question. Okay. Yeah, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, for your, um, for your material, uh, sorry, one question? Okay, um, real quick, yes or no. Did you, when you did your uh, material reliability compatibility, did you test with the IT equipment? No, it was test, it's a component level testing. It's component okay. level validation, that, that exactly the, yes. Okay, and is that something as we move forward, um, we need to consider how those interactions with the IT equipment impact the component reliability? Well, there can be complex reactions, like of if there are leaching from a cable that affects some other subcomponent. And no, we're not evaluating that at this level, but it's certainly something that needs to be considered as we move uh, through at this process of qualification. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>